Hey, everybody. This is Michael Watley. I am the North Carolina Republican chair, and we're coming to you live from NC GOP studios. And uh, welcome to this week's version of our chairman's chat with Tamara Berenger, who is a professor over at the UNC uh, Business School and uh, former state senator and running for the Supreme Court. Tamara, thanks so much for joining us tonight. It's my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Michael. Excellent. Why don't you tell everybody just a little bit about yourself and uh, where you come from and uh, why you're running for the Supreme Court? Well, I'm running for the Supreme Court because it's so critical, so critical this year. Um, well, and it's always very important. I'm originally from Cleveland County outside of Shelby. Uh, I'm a farm girl. My daddy was a farmer. Uh, I have lived for the last uh, 25 or so years in Wake County. And I did represent Southern Wake County in the North Carolina General Assembly as a senator, where I served as chair of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, I've been an attorney for 35 years. During that time, for about 20 years, I practiced law uh, representing uh, families and businesses with uh, business and tax matters, which makes me an unusual but very much needed candidate for the North Carolina Supreme Court. We need business uh, expertise on the court as we rebuild our, uh, our economy. Uh, for the last 15 years, I have taught at the University of North Carolina Keenan Flagler Business School in Chapel Hill where I teach Master of Accounting students and also undergraduate business students, uh, law and ethics. Uh, I, uh, my husband and I were therapeutic foster parents with the Methodist Home for Children. And that's really why I aspire to public service, why I went into the Senate in the first place, because our uh, foster care system, our children, uh, our families in crisis need good leadership. And that's why I'm continuing to, uh, to pursue public service. Excellent. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, we've talked a lot on this series about the importance of the Supreme Court and in, in the Court of Appeals in North Carolina uh, and the fact that we have with a six to one Democratic progressive liberal majority on the court. Uh, we're seeing opinions that are just not uh, resonant with uh, North Carolina values. Talk a little bit about a decision that you made to run for the court and how you see uh, returning that court back to a balanced court. Uh, is going to mean a lot for North Carolina. Well, certainly all the decisions that the North Carolina Supreme Court make affect North Carolinians in their daily life, and so many people don't realize that. But I'm particularly motivated and inspired to be on the court for uh, two specific reasons. One is that uh, the business court, which we have one of the best business courts in the, in the country, uh, all business court decisions from the trial court appeal directly to the North Carolina Supreme Court. That would be complex business uh, questions, tax questions, and frankly, we need expertise there, as I said, to rebuild our economy and continue a strong business climate uh, for North Carolina that we had before the uh, uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic. The other reason, and really the compelling reason, has to do with children and families in crisis. It's come to my attention that there have been two uh, opinions just recently, uh, 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 with a, uh, two opinions made recently by the North Carolina Supreme Court, where um, they have basically uh, uh, turned pedophiles loose and have created a book of law, a precedent of law that will make it much more difficult for us to prosecute these, these uh, pedophiles, these monsters that, that really pursue our children. Uh, having been a foster mom for 10 years, uh, we had children in our home that had unspeakable things done to, uh, to them. And I don't know of a single time of the children that were in our home that had the perpetrators of the horrible, horrible things that happened to them even prosecuted. We need more prosecution of these people, not less. It is uh, estimated that a, a pedophile, a child molester, will molest uh, approximately 117 times during that, during the pedophile's uh, run in in uh, in this uh, despicable uh, uh, behavior, we've got to put a stop to it. We have to protect our children. We have to protect our families from those kinds of people. Yeah, and I tell you, you know, when you think about uh, where we stand with the court, uh, where we stand with all of our election cycles, you know, we're we're looking at a cycle where North Carolina is a top four state for President Trump. 
Uh, we know that we need to be able to win here as well as uh, Florida, Ohio, Pennsylvania to get him reelected. We're the number one Senate race in the country. We're the number one governor's race in the country. And yet everywhere I go, people talk about the Supreme Court and people talk about how important it is for us as a state not to have a six to one liberal majority, progressive majority, radical majority on the Supreme Court. Uh, talk about you know your efforts campaign wise. Uh, you know we've got Paul Newby who's also running, uh, Phil Berger Jr. who's also running. About the efforts that you guys have done around the state to be able to promote uh, responsible jurists and conservative judges as a, as a group. Well, we have. We we very much have run as a team. Uh, there are three of us running for the North Carolina Supreme Court, all three different seats, not running against each other. And North Carolina is a very big state, and we can't be everywhere all the time. So we all carry the message that we need balance on the court. We need conservative, common sense judges, judges who will uh, apply the law as our representatives have created and also protect and defend and apply the Constitution as it was written. There are also five very fine candidates for the North Carolina Court of, of, of Appeals, and they've done the same thing. They've carried our message, all eight of us, all over the state. And I think that's one of the reasons you may be hearing so much about the, the court, is that we really have worked so hard to make people understand just how important it is. Yeah, I think that uh, the, the, the whole concept of running as a team is something we at NCGOP have strongly supported and I know you guys have done a fantastic job kind of pushing that out there. You know, and, and you talk about having a state uh, so big as North Carolina, I always joke we've got 100 counties in three different time zones, but uh, you know, it really helps to have uh, a number of uh, the candidates that are out and about and able to, to kind of push the slate uh, concept for it. So we're really glad that we're seeing that from, from your perspective. You know, when we look at you as a candidate, you're pretty unique. Uh, in that you're the only one that's running who's actually served in the legislature. Talk about, you know, your experience as a, as a state senator and, uh, and how that translates into helping you understand the role of the courts and how you would be a better judge for it. Uh, it has uh, really helped me to understand just how important the judges are and also uh, the, the importance of checks and balances. Uh, when I uh, served in the North Carolina General Assembly, uh, I represented um, about a quarter of a million people in Southwest Wake County. I was elected to be their representative to go and speak to them about the law or speak for them about the law and create laws and draft laws and vote on laws or vote against laws, but to have their voice heard uh, for the people, by the people, of the people. That's, that's what, what my role was then for almost seven years. Uh, the judge's role is not to do that. The judge's role is to apply the law as it was written, and even then only interpret it if there's a clear ambiguity. Uh, I saw firsthand the long hours that representatives debated and negotiated and heard stakeholder uh, comments and study and, uh, and, and did this all, uh, all over months and months of time. And so we have to respect that. We are a democratic republic and the republic part is the representative part. And I was so blessed to be a part of that, but I also now know and very well cherish the fact that judges should not intervene in that kind of, uh, of uh, legislating from the bench. They should not do that. And I have pledged that I will not. Excellent. You know, I want to switch gears real quick. We talk about how big North Carolina is and all the travel that's involved with it. You know, one of the things that has come up with every single candidate that we've talked to is how important uh, their spouse has been uh, in keeping them grounded and helping them understand, you know, the true values that we're running for uh, as you're running all around the state. You've got a fantastic husband in Brent uh, who has, has been with you through, you know, uh, uh, your campaigns for Senate. Uh, you know, while you're being a professor, um, and, and now obviously with you as a candidate. So I just have to ask, I mean, how, uh, how did you manage to snag him and, and, and get him uh, to ask you to marry him and, and, uh, and, and talk about uh, how great uh, it is for you to have him uh, to be able to use as a sounding board? Uh, Brent is absolutely a wonderful, wonderful husband. We've been married for 38 years. Uh, we didn't rush into anything. We dated for five years before that, and we actually met in the first week of undergraduate school. 
Um, we practiced law together. We were law partners for much of that 20 plus years, 25 years that I practiced law. And we were foster parents together. And we have three adopted uh, children from the foster care system. And so we have parented together as well. Uh, when you have children come into your home that have had horrible things done to them, one little girl had been locked in a closet, uh, not given water in the dark, screaming and yelling for hours at a time, and she wasn't even three years old. It's tough to parent a child like that, and it's tough to be a parent under those circumstances. And so Brent and I really forged so much of our, uh, our wonderful, wonderful relationship through those really tough and challenging times. Uh, he, he helped me and supported me through my Senate, Senate times when, uh, when we were uh, fighting for good legislation for children and families and also uh, uh, helped me to vet some of the tax uh, legislation that we did. Both Brent and I practiced tax together. And I can actually say, Michael, that I'm probably the only judicial candidate that can say I lowered your taxes. But I didn't do that by myself. I obviously, I did a great deal of the drafting on those bills. But um, I also had Brent who looked over some of that information for me, as did some of my colleagues at the university. Um, and of course, the many, many stakeholders, the accountants and business lawyers across the state. And so I cannot, I cannot underestimate, nor can I tell you just how wonderful it is and has been. I mean, Brent's really, the way we say this, Brent's really more political than I am. I'm more policy. And so we have made just a great team over all these years. Well, that is, that is absolutely awesome. You know, uh, and I think your role as a professor also is something where, you know, you're a teacher, but you're a mentor. Uh, you have, you know, students that come into the program and, and stay for a year or two, uh, that you get an opportunity to kind of help them grow. Talk about how fulfilling it is for you uh, in your professor role uh, to be able to, to work and help shape the next generation of leaders. Uh, Michael, teaching is the air I breathe. It truly is, teaching is the air I breathe. Uh, when I was in the General Assembly, I've taught full time throughout that, that time. Uh, and as a matter of fact, even before the 15 years at Keenan Flagler, uh, I was at Meredith College. Uh, I developed the, uh, uh, their first uh, business uh, law uh, paralegal program. And then I was at NC State at the pool school for five years before that. Um, and so I absolutely, it has informed me, it has shaped me. One of the things that I enjoy the most about my teaching at this point is I'm the director of the Master of Accounting Mentorship Program. And this is a program for underrepresented minorities and um, first-generation college students. I'm a first-generation college student. Um, my first home didn't have indoor plumbing. And after the tap tobacco barn burned, we moved into a single wide trailer and lived on the edge of poverty um, until about the time I went to school. And so to have the opportunity to work with these students. And by the way, the program is now 10 years old. It's so exciting. It's, it's uh, 10 years old and it has really helped to bring diversity to the business school and to the Master of Accounting program. And to see these students who have a similar experience to mine, even though I'm 35 years, 40 years older than them, um, to be able to be a part of their development, it's just, it's a rewarding experience for me and I just, I rejoice, I rejoice in, in, the, uh, uh, in the, the strides they make and the improvements. You know, when we look at this election cycle, uh, we, we kind of have big picture, you know, President Trump, the coronavirus, uh, you know, national security issues, um, and, and we have minor issues, uh, local issues that obviously we, we, we deal with in, in, in uh, the counties and the cities and locals all across the state. But one of the key themes that we keep running across uh, as we talk to folks this, this, this time around is, you know, the law and order theme, uh, public safety theme. You know, we had riots and looting um, and vandalism that, that uh, terrorized not just Raleigh, but Charlotte, uh, Fayetteville, Wilson, uh, Greensboro, Winston-Salem, I mean, cities all across the state uh, where we saw rioting and, and vandalism and property destruction earlier. Uh, and this is something that, that voters are keenly aware of here. You know, when we talk about an overall uh, agenda of wanting to see the rule of law enforced fairly uh, in North Carolina, as well as the rest of the countries, you know, what does that bring to mind for you? And how do you see the Republicans as, as kind of really being the party that is going to support uh, 
you know, law and order and, and community safety? Uh, community safety, uh, public safety, family safety is just paramount. Being the mother of three, three children uh, who are all uh, college age or more, they're out in the world. And it makes me, uh, I don't want to be nervous about that. I want them to have a safe North Carolina and a safe, safe United States to be in. Uh, I, uh, uh, it also gets back to that whole business of, of safe families and children. Many people do not realize that, uh, the, uh, uh, that, that human trafficking and foster care are very interrelated. And without a strong law enforcement to shut down the human trafficking, our foster children are at great risk. Think about it, 70 to 80 percent of all uh, domestically trafficked children are coming out of our foster care system. If we don't have good law enforcement, those children are at even greater risk. And I want to make it clear, it's not the foster parents who are trafficking them. These are children who don't have stable families. These are children who often think they have no future. And when one of these pedophiles or one of these exploiters, these people that exploit children, come around and tell them they're beautiful and that they're going to love them and take good care of them, they fall for it. We need strong law enforcement, not only to uh, protect our streets, which we absolutely do, but we also need strong law enforcement to shut down that human trafficking. There, there's so many things that law enforcement and the rule of law are so important for um, that, that we really don't see day to day. Yeah, you know, you talk about Jim O'Neill and the work that he's done over in Forsyth County, which is one of the safest counties you know, in the state um, in, in terms of uh, law enforcement there. And then the image that we, we can't get out of our heads of in the midst of the rioting, in the midst of the looting, uh, seeing Governor Cooper walk from one end of his compound, you know, down to the other end of the compound uh, with his fist raised in the air with the rioters and the looters uh, really kind of represents uh, to us, you know, some pretty important uh, positions here in this election cycle. I agree. And, and as I said, it's, it's not just the rioters and looters, although that is incredibly important and incredibly uh, needs to be dealt with, but it pervades our entire society. Public safety, family safety, stability, uh, to have loving, healthy, educated families. We have to have that. Um, we have to have uh, um, public safety, the rule of law. We have to have the law applied as it was written. All those things are so important to the stability and the future of, of our country. Yeah, you know, and we talk about the judges, you know, uh, we can't forget that President Trump, uh, when he was campaigning back in 2016, put out a list and said, this is the type of people that we would want to be federal jurists. And over the course of the last four years, he's appointed over 200, uh, you know, uh, nominees that have gone through the Senate. And we got to thank Senator Tom Tillis for his great leadership on the committee in getting all of those nominees through. Um, we've had two of them on the Supreme Court, uh, Neil Gorsuch and, and Brett Kavanaugh, who've done such a fantastic job of shifting that court and making sure that we're going to have a conservative court for the next lifetime. But we also, on the circuit courts, have seen a number of those remade to where they've got you know, conservative majorities, including the Ninth Circuit, as well as all of the different district court judges that we've had. Talk a little bit about President Trump and his legacy of appointing these federal judges and what can be done over the next four years to really kind of cement that in when we return him for four more years. Well, what is so important for North Carolinians to understand and when I've been out, uh, out in uh, the different counties, uh, uh, it's not understood. Uh, most of our cases from North Carolina, almost none ever go to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, our, last, our last stop uh, for law is the, the North Carolina Supreme Court. So all of the kinds of things, for example, the pedophile cases I told you about, uh, any of these kinds of cases, that, that's the end of it. That's the, that's the last, the last um, say. Uh, and so I think what we need to do and, and what, what we have is a good model to have balance and to have a good conservative voice, not just in the federal courts, because the federal courts really aren't, aren't um, as I said, we don't, our, our North Carolina's court system 
is, is a system of, of, of itself. And so we need that same kind of common sense, constitutional, uh, uh, conservative judges. I also wanna make sure people understand what the word conservative means. It doesn't mean the same thing as in a political realm of being conservative versus liberal. Conservative has a special meeting with the judges. It means that we're not going to legislate from the bench. We're going to stay in our lane. We're going to do what a judge is supposed to do, apply the law as it, as it is written. Excellent. Well, we're going to have, uh, as we mentioned already, eight different judges between the Court of Appeals. We've got five great candidates who are running. And on the Supreme Court, we've got uh, three of you uh, with Phil Berger Jr. and uh, Justice Newby and yourself who are running. But we're not running an eight on eight slate. These are actually individual races. So what can the, uh, the viewers of the Chairman's Chat series, um, we've got, got them all across the state, what can they do to help Tamara Berenger? What do we need to be doing in order to make sure in your race uh, that we're going to help uh, get you to the winner's circle? Uh, well, thank you for that question. Uh, a couple of things. Make, please go vote. Please go vote. It's estimated that there will be over a half a million, uh, excuse me, over, uh, yes, no, over five million votes cast in North Carolina in this election. Over five million, probably five to six million. The margin of victory or defeat will be somewhere between 25,000 and 100,000 votes. That is slim, very, very slim. So please go out and vote. Share the information with your friends. Every vote is going to count. It always does, but it's really going to count this time. Also, uh, the judge's uh, election is at the bottom of the ballot, the back of the ballot. Uh, my understanding in Wake County, we're going to have a three-page ballot. So you've got to go to the bottom of the third page to even find us. In many counties, it's a matter of turning the ballot over. So when I talk to people, I tell people, turn the ballot over. The other thing that I've discovered in talking to people across North Carolina, they think that they can vote a straight ticket. There's no such thing as a straight ticket voting. You can vote for all of, of the Republicans, but you have to do it a race at a time. So please go find uh, the judge's race, particularly go find Tamara Berenger's race and mark that. Also, these campaigns are very expensive. And so what I've told folks is that uh, we don't have to have as much money as the Democrats, but we have to have enough to win. And I need enough to win. Small and large contributions are all welcome. Uh, the small contributions add up because we need a wide uh, network as well as a deep network. Uh, and you can go to TamaraBeringer.com, TamaraBeringer.com, and it has information about me, a little more about my background, and also has an opportunity for you to either mail in a check, check or, uh, or um, um, hit the donate button. Also, I'm beginning to get out. I do wear my mask when I go out. But I am beginning to go out. I'm going to be in the Asheville area on Tuesday with the Republican women. I'm a former uh, or a past Republican Women Club's president. I'm going to be down east in Little Washington with uh, the GOP chair there, um, uh, Senator Bill Cook, in a couple of weeks. So if there's an opportunity either on Zoom or actually in my car, I'll come. I'll put my mask on and I'll come, uh, come sit in some living rooms or uh, in a GOP headquarters and talk to you folks. Excellent. Well, I got to say, uh, I appreciate the work that you've been doing, the, the legwork that you've put into this race. Uh, appreciate your service, obviously, in the state Senate uh, and at the university. But, you know, your work with foster children and, and your support on those issues is something that is uh, tremendously, tremendously important. I think you bring uh, such an important voice to that. And I want to thank you for coming on the chairman's chat and uh, talking to a little bit about uh, your race and about the uh, judicial races and uh, appreciate you coming and joining us. I'm so glad to do it. Thank you so much, Chair Wadley. Absolutely, and I also want to thank all of our viewers all across the state. Uh, we're very excited about this series and uh, appreciate everybody tuning in. And I believe uh, next week we're going to have uh, Steve Troxler, uh, our Commissioner for Agriculture, who's our Secretary for Agriculture, uh, who's going to be joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you so much and have a great night.